Hello, I'm Lauren McCafferty, and I'm an emergency ultrasound fellow at University Hospital's Cleveland Medical Center. I'll be presenting a rare case of reverse Takotsubo peripartum cardiomyopathy that was diagnosed in the emergency department using point-of-care ultrasound performed by one of our interns, Dr. Matthew Mullins. To start with the case, the patient is a 30-year-old female G1P1 who presented to the emergency department three days postpartum for acute onset chest pain. She described pleuritic, retrosternal, non-radiating pain associated with some shortness of breath. Symptoms started approximately one hour prior to arrival and had been relatively constant since, slightly worse with exertion. Up until that point, she had been doing well and review of systems was otherwise negative. Her pregnancy was unremarkable. She was diagnosed with questionable chorioamnionitis around the time of delivery for which she received a dose of antibiotics. However, her peripartum course was otherwise uncomplicated and she delivered a healthy infant at full term. She had no underlying cardiopulmonary disease and her medical history was significant for depression, anxiety, and pseudoseizures. On exam, her vitals were stable. She was well appearing and no distress, sitting comfortably in bed and speaking in full sentences. Her lungs were clear. She appeared euvolemic without any lower extremity edema and no clinical signs of DVT. Her abdomen was benign and her exam overall was non-focal. An EKG was obtained, which was normal, it showed normal sinus rhythm, no ischemic changes or arrhythmias. Her labs were unremarkable as well. She had no evidence of preeclampsia, and her troponin was within normal limits. A CT angio of her chest was obtained uh, primarily to evaluate for a pulmonary embolus and showed no significant findings. At this point, a point of care ultrasound was performed. So here we have the parasternal short axis view where we're looking at the heart and cross section just below the level of the AV valves. So here we see the left ventricle in the center of the screen. It's nice and round. You can see the papillary muscles really well. And then the right ventricle is kind of sitting on top and hugging the LV from above. So this is all normal. However, what you do see in this image is that the left ventricle is somewhat dilated and the overall squeeze is reduced. Um, so remember that the left ventricle contracts concentrically, so with each contraction you should see the left ventricular walls thickening and moving closer together. In this patient's heart, it's struggling to do that, um, much more so than you would expect to see in an otherwise healthy 30-year-old. So moving on to the parasternal long axis view, you can again see that the left ventricular walls aren't moving as much as normal. Also, the mitral valve isn't quite as mobile either. So in a normal heart, uh, the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve comes up and nearly touches the interventricular septum during diastole. Here, however, you see that that's not the case. Um, so you can see just visually that the valve isn't moving quite as much, but if you also wanted to measure it quantitatively, you could use M mode and measure the endpoint septal separation or EPSS which is the distance between the tip of the mitral valve and the septum um, during diastole when it's fully open. Um, so this measurement would be increased in this patient, which is another marker of dysfunction. So here we have the apical four chamber view. So the left side of the heart is on, our, is on the right side of the screen and the patient's right side of the heart is on our left. Um, so here you can see that the, the apex is actually, the apex of the left ventricle is actually contracting fairly well um, compared to the base of the heart near the, the valve, just distal to the valve, you see that there's not much movement there at all. Um, and this, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but um, these ultrasound findings were suggestive of uh, the dilated cardiomyopathy with a reverse Takotsubo pattern. So moving on with the patient's clinical course, given that she was in the immediate postpartum period, she was admitted to the OB service with concerns for peripartum cardiomyopathy. So a repeat troponin was drawn about 12 hours after her initial troponin in the emergency department, and it went from normal all the way up to 3.92. Her BNP was also elevated in the 1200s. 
It's not entirely clear if she had an EKG during this time or what the delay in the repeat troponin was, um, but she was apparently hemodynamically stable and had no other clinical changes during this time. So at this point, cardiology was consulted. She was given aspirin, Berlinta, and a heparin bolus in anticipation for cardiac cath. So she underwent a left heart cath, which was normal, showing clean coronary arteries. She then underwent a comprehensive echocardiogram, which was consistent with the point of care ultrasound findings. So here's her parasternal long axis view, and here is her apical four view. And in both of these images, you see that the basal part of the heart, the part closest in the the part of the ventricle closest to the valves, is not really contracting at all. But the apex, the farthest point from the valves, is actually contracting fairly well. Um, so this was a, this study was interpreted as having a reduced ejection fraction of 45% with severe left ventricular basal wall hypokinesis, consistent with reverse Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. So at this point, she was formally diagnosed with reverse Takotsubo peripartum cardiomyopathy. So over the coming days, she was managed supportively, her symptoms improved, her troponin downtrended, and she was discharged home. Two weeks later, she was readmitted with recurrent symptoms. She had repeat cardiac enzyme testing and BNP, which were normal. She had a repeat echocardiogram, um, a, for, a comprehensive echocardiogram, which revealed a normalized ejection fraction without any regional wall motion abnormalities. Um, so this confirmed that her reverse Takotsubo peripartum cardiomyopathy had resolved, and this was within 15 days of her initial presentation. So she remained stable and was discharged home the following day um, to follow up with cardiology, and she ultimately did well. Now I'm going to give a brief overview on peripartum cardiomyopathy and Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, and then talk a little more about the basal type variant that our patient had. So peripartum cardiomyopathy is a well-documented complication of pregnancy. This can occur anywhere from the last month of gestation up to five months postpartum. The exact pathophysiology for this is not entirely clear, though we do know that advanced maternal age, hypertension, and multiparity are risk factors. This is characterized by dilated cardiomyopathy with left ventricular dilation and systolic dysfunction, and in severe cases or as the disease progresses, you may see by atrial and or right ventricular dilation, as well as mitral regurgitation. So prognosis, approximately 50% of patients have complete resolution of symptoms, another 25% have partial resolution of symptoms, and then another 25% have persistent heart failure. The mortality for this is variable. It reaches 9% worldwide and is slightly lower in the United States. Um, so the general treatment of this is primarily the same as regular heart failure treatment through pharmacologic means, optimization of volume status. And um, these patients also may need anticoagulation um, as they are in at increased risk for thromboembolic disease. Takotsubo cardiomyopathy is a transient, usually reversible, stress or car catecholamine-induced dilated cardiomyopathy. It classically affects postmenopausal females. And while we don't know the exact etiology or pathophysiology of Takotsubo, similar to peripartum cardiomyopathy, we do know that hormonal changes, underlying neurologic or psychiatric disorders, and possibly some genetic factors um, put patients at higher risk. So clinically, this mimics acute coronary syndrome as these patients often present with chest pain, have anginal equivalents, ischemic EKG changes, and elevated cardiac enzymes. What differentiates Takotsubo from acute coronary syndrome is the cardiac catheterization, in which these patients don't have structural, significantly structural lesions. Since you can't really differentiate between ACS and Takotsubo from a purely clinical perspective, you really do need to treat these patients as though they have ACS until proven otherwise. Sonographically, there are different variants of Takotsubo. The classic variant is by far the most common and then there are a few other far less common variants, including the reverse basal type, which we saw in our patient. So this is the classic pattern of Takotsubo. So you see 
apical ballooning with hypokinesis. So the apex of the heart kind of balloons out, doesn't really contract very well. Whereas the basal segment, which is the part of the ventricle that's closest to the valve, is still contracting um, fairly well. This is in contrast to the reverse Takotsubo pattern, which as the name implies, essentially the reverse of the classic form. So in reverse Takotsubo, the apex of the heart is contracting quite well, whereas the basal segment is uh, somewhat hypokinetic. So just to give you a little bit more information about the reverse basal type, uh, this accounts for 2.2% of all Takotsubo cases, so it's fairly rare. And it's an exceedingly rare form of peripartum cardiomyopathy with only a small handful of cases that are known. The reverse type um, tends to have a predilection for younger patients, um, again, with the neuro and psychiatric history. The mortality rate ranges anywhere from 0 to 8%, um, and there's a relatively low risk of recurrence with this. Um, the management for um, reverse basal type is generally supportive, or really either type of Takotsubo, is generally supportive, um, managing the heart failure symptoms, optimizing volume status, and providing inotropic support as needed. In summary, any peripartum patient with cardiopulmonary symptoms should raise concern for peripartum cardiomyopathy, as these patients have higher mortality and risk of persistent heart failure. As demonstrated in this case, emergency medicine providers can quickly diagnose peripartum cardiomyopathy at the bedside. It's important to have a low threshold for cardiac focus in these patients, recognize certain patterns, and promptly make the diagnosis as this will positively impact patient management and outcomes. These are my references. Thank you for listening.